Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session, Genomics to All. Thanks for taking the time to select us as your first choice today. <laughs> so today, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, equity in genomics, um, access, um, and then also kind of explore what we can do to try to improve you know, some of the data sets that are used. I think one of the things that we have to kind of keep in mind is we talk about new technology and developments in healthcare is to remember it needs to be kind of grounded in a quality framework. And when I say that, one of the principles of quality, as many of you know, in healthcare is to make sure that it's you know, equitable. So that's how we're going to kind of pursue some of this today. So as we start, um, we're going to start with Alicia. Um, and so, Alicia, um, you've been a research scientist. You are an executive at a genomics company. Tell us a little bit about, you know, your thoughts around, you know, equitable access in genomics. Yeah, this is a really great question, and I think it's a theme that has definitely emerged for a lot of companies over the last couple of years to think about equity. In genomics especially, I think that means we have to think about what's the equity in the data that's being collected. and. From that, it really has to do with how do we get equitable participation in research. I think one of the things that a lot of folks forget when we're doing genomic research is we think, oh, we're just going to collect these samples, we're going to sequence them, we're going to put them in this database. But that data is connected to an individual. And if you want that individual to participate in your study, you have to be able to communicate to them what is the value that they get back from that participation. It has to be that two-way street. I don't think, I think these days participants are a lot more aware of what is the value that their data might provide. And for the research community, it's up to us to also say, thank you for participating in our study. This is the value you'll get back. You'll get the return of results, or you will be helping this type of research, and this is how the results of this research might help you in your community. And I think we have the obligation to do that. Okay. Thanks, Alicia. So Andrew, tell us a little bit, you know, you're a CEO at a genomics company. What are some of the programs that are, are taking on access issues and serve as a model for others that you're seeing? Yeah, so I completely agree with, with what Alicia just said. We at Variant Bio, we're doing genomic drug discovery rather than being the, you know, nth company building a European ancestry dominated <laughs> database. We're going around the world and, and partnering with communities who've never before participated in genomic research. Um, and the model that we think every company should use has, has three parts of it. One is you have to provide the data. That should be a given. I think that's non-controversial at this point. Mm. The data has to be provided to the communities who contribute it, to researchers from those communities, um, and that's just an, an absolute must. Uh, we think companies should go further than that. Um, and so we have a model that also shares financial value with the, uh, the, the individuals, the communities that contributed the data. I think there's too much in the industry of, hey, you should contribute for the good of science. Meanwhile, we're a for-profit company. We're generating a financial return. Um, people realize that that's not a model that, that makes much sense. So we have a benefit-sharing model that if we end up succeeding financially, that value is shared with the communities that, that contributed the data in the first place. And the third aspect that I think is critical and is the future of genomic research, genomic drug discovery, is ensuring that any drugs uh, any diagnostics, any devices that result from that research, they just absolutely have to be made available to the communities that originally contributed the data. So we have what we call a therapeutics access pledge, guaranteeing that if we develop a drug or a partner of, of ours in the future develops a drug based on genomic research, it will be made available to the communities. So I think that's just absolutely critical. That's the future of, of genomic research, sharing the data. Uh, sharing financial value and ensuring that, that uh, any therapeutics developed are, are made available. That's becoming the standard in clinical trials. Yeah, most companies, if you do a clinical trial in a certain geography, you have to ensure that those drugs are later made available. And we should have the same standard in genomic research. Okay. Thanks for that, Andrew. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good segue into, you know, uh, now me. You know, she's one of the rising leaders in, in healthcare, still in training. Is really just seeing what's you know, currently going on, but we're gonna shift gears just a little bit. So tell us, what has been the role of you know, medicine and science in perpetuating ra racism in health and medicine? And what can we do to regain trust in the communities that you know, they serve? Yeah, I think something that's often missed in conversations about medicine and racism is the idea that 
you know, medicine wasn't just contributing to these issues, but we were actually co-conspirators in the creation of racism in the United States. So medicine for a long time played a role in um, giving kind of uh, credit to the idea that black people in particular were physiologically inferior to white people in the United States. So I think that, you know, for so long, medicine was focused on kind of creating that dichotomy of these, this is a group of people that is physiologically inferior, this is why you're having poor health, as opposed to looking to all the different factors that play into health. So when I hear people like Alicia and Andrew talking about how you have to create a model where you are bringing in members of the community to actually contribute to the research and science being done and then benefiting from it, I think that's still a model that is missing in healthcare in general. You have a lot of work being done in communities of color, but the benefit is still not being seen by these communities. So I think, you know, the way moving forward, um, what we really need to do in medicine is first acknowledge this problem. This is still something that is not discussed in medical schools up until the past couple years. Many of us in medicine are not taught about the history of medicine in the US and the roles that we've played in the atrocities that we continue to see in healthcare. Um, so I think acknowledging the problem first and then openly discussing it with the new learners that are coming in so we can make better change in the future. Thank you. So I think that sets us up perfectly for Keolin. So uh, tell us a little bit about you know, your perspective for access you know, to genomics. You know, given your work in the scientific community, um, being a native Hawaiian and, and some of the research you've done on indigenous populations. Yeah, uh, I was just reflecting on this recently. I mean, I think everyone here knows that there's just a dearth of diversity data when we really consider the full spectrum of human genetic variation and the sort of downstream therapies that many of us are hoping to deliver to the least, the last, the looked over, the left out. That pretty much represents everyone. We're here in California, one of the most diverse states in our country, second to only Hawaii, <laughs> just for the record. And, uh, and it's really interesting because if we think about access to clinical trials and who's included in genome-wide association studies, those numbers do not reflect the diversity we see every day, certainly not in this room at this point in time. So what do we do to change that? So I guess when I was younger, I would have been all about just increasing diversity and moving forward with that capacity. And you could have used the greater good argument on me. But now it's about whose greater good are we talking about? And it's about building health systems, circular economic systems, and things that actually empower our communities in meaningful ways. So moving past just the, the DEI. So ask yourself, what does that mean now? Well, DEI actually means diversifying my equity and investments. So from our point of view, Companies like Variant Bio are the new status quo in not only moving forward with precision medicine, but creating true partnerships that reflect those values. So as far as my own research interests go, of course, we, we want to dig deeper into those things and, and hopefully we can really create more equitable relationships around that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of leads us into the, the next question because you know, obviously all of this is about data. And so, you know, Alicia, how do we get there? How do we develop more inclusive data sets? Yeah, this is a great question. I mean, in the NIH's All of Us Research Program, um, and I'm a co-PI on that program, we really think about enrollment and recruitment across very diverse populations. I think one of the things um, that's really key to this, and um, Kiolo mentioned this as well, is you can't just go into a population and say, hey, we're here, we're doing this really cool research study, come and join us. You need to have that lasting foundation of partnership um, long term. It has to feel like you're not just here to parachute in, do your study and leave, but rather that you develop deep relationships with the community and bring them in for the participation, especially if you're gonna do longitudinal care. Um, and longitudinal data collection. I think the other thing as we think about the data side of things um, that's important is when you think about the way that the FDA asks you to put together your drug trial data submission, and they ask you to exclude certain comorbidities in your, um, in your recruitment, 
there is unconscious bias in that to begin with because now you have higher morbidities in certain populations to begin with because of lack of access to food, mm. lack of access to health care. And now you've built into your trial recruitment innate bias towards certain populations. And so part of this is also for regulatory bodies like the FDA to start to think about how do they look at real world evidence when you're doing trial recruitment and data submissions to ensure that there's more equitable ways to think about that data, to evaluate that data, so that you're not building bias into, um, into the system to begin with. Thank you. So I, I think that's a perfect segue to, to Andrew. So what, what are some of the pitfalls that you see when we talk about you know, digital bias in, in data sets? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so, so many in my line of work, which is genomic drug discovery, there's so many communities around the world who've never participated, never had the opportunity to participate in genomic research, which means they can't benefit from uh, precision medicine. There's no data available to, uh, to, to benefit them. It simply doesn't exist. Um, but it goes beyond that. It's also not just uh, problematic for those communities. I think it's a disaster for the world. Bill Gates talked earlier today about, he, he briefly mentioned that I think most people in this room will know, there's more genetic diversity from um, Africa than any other, any other continent. Um, some say more in Africa than the rest of the world combined. Um, and yet 1% of the data Bill, Bill quoted in uh, genomic data sets um, has an origin in Africa. That is handicapping all of us who are trying to do genomic drug discovery. We are only utilizing a small sliver of the world's diversity because we have almost no representation from Africa. We have almost no representation from other um, communities around the world, such as in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, yeah. South Pacific Islands. Um, that data just doesn't exist. That makes all of our jobs to try and um, discover life-saving drugs uh, that much more difficult. So it's an issue for the communities who are losing access to you know, cutting edge advances in precision medicine, and it's an issue for all of us, and I think that's what needs to change. Companies that are doing genomic drug discovery um, don't need to view diversity as a side PR project, mm. CSR. We're gonna look good if we talk about diversity a little bit. They need to realize that it will fundamentally improve their ability to function as a company, to get their jobs done, to discover new drugs. And when, we, when that is internalized, uh, there is a missed opportunity out there, a missed business opportunity, um, a missed scientific opportunity. That's when I think change will, will really take place. Yeah, and, and that raises a good point because you know, when you talk about patients and point of contact, you know, it, it is their physician. It, it's who they see out in the, the clinical world. So now me, you know, we often hear about, you know, interpersonal racism in medicine. I mean, what are some of the hidden systemic ways that racism is built into, you know, clinical practice? Yeah, I think this is an interesting question. One of the ways that racism is kind of built into the infrastructure of medicine is the kind of clinical algorithms that we use to treat our patients. So a lot of medicine is focused on streamlining what we do for patient care. So a patient comes in with XYZ symptoms, you put them on a specific clinical pathway based on an algorithm. So a lot of these algorithms actually take into consideration a patient's race. More specifically, is this patient black or non-black? <laughs> so one specific example that I talk about is something called EGFR, or estimated glomerular filtration rate. This is a calculation that we use to measure someone's kidney function. There's a completely separate calculation that's put into play if the physician identifies that patient as black. So what this does is it artificially elevates their EGFR value, making it so that their kidney function looks like it's higher. So the end result is that black patients actually have to be much sicker than non-black counterparts to get no notified that they have kidney disease. So what that means is we have later access to kidney care, we have lower coverage for insurance, we have uh, decreased access to some cancer medications, um, decreased access to diabetes medications, et cetera. So this is a very blatant way in which racism leads to poor health outcomes for particularly black patients. Similar algorithms using race are used to measure lung function. Um, there's been data coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine that has shown that Things like pulse, oxim pulse oximeters measure, used to measure oxygen do not function in people that have darker skin. So you can think about how the impacts of COVID that are being seen in communities of color that the actual tools, tools that we're using are not built to work for us. 
So that's one way that um, racism really plays into medicine that is sort of hidden. It's not the physician going out and saying, I don't like you because you're a specific skin tone. It's the actual algorithms and the tools that we're using in the office that don't function for this population. Thank you. So Kiel, you know, a lot of your education, training, mm -hmm. you know, um, work you've done as a, you know, professor has been really during a time when there's been a lot of advances in genomic medicine. So Absolutely. how do you approach this whole, you know, aspect of, you know, um, creating inclusive data sets in, in what you do and, and what are some of your perspectives on, you know, how we navigate it? Yeah, great question. <clears throat> as the millennials say, a lot to unpack there. So before I get there, uh, I really want to get back to the data kind of, kind of issue here. So as of 2018, data has become the number one most valuable commodity on planet Earth, surpassing oil. It is the foundational resource for many of the largest companies in the world. Our communities know that. We know the value of it. We have begun to recognize data as a resource like water, like oil, like diamonds, rare earth minerals, lithium, et cetera. And so educating our communities on what that means and how that information and how that resource should work for them uh, is a very, very important piece of what's, what's going on now and into the future. So beyond the scientific questions we ask, which I think is really important that physicians and scientists are reflexive and they think about their positionality as scientists. Sometimes the question you're attempting to ask is not yours to ask. It is not appropriate unless you have community buy-in and that community claims you and they recognize you as a partner, a lifelong partner. You can't just flutter around from community to community. That's uh, literally the definition of colonialism. So I think that's a really important piece. Now, now that we know data is valuable, it's how do we put communities in positions of control of that information so you get into the sort of indigenous data sovereignty of that. And we in this genomics community know that digital sequence information fits neatly into the big data surveillance ecosystem. And that's really important for empowering others and creating equitable relationships. So that means that what does, a, what does an actual partnership look like that's equitable? Well, it really should involve vertical integration of technologies. 72% of genome-wide association studies have taken place in three countries on planet Earth the US, the UK, and Iceland. So what does that mean? Well, it means that all of this biological information is being outsourced to those three countries. So that's the continent of Africa, which we just spoke of as the place, as the most human genetic variation on planet Earth. This is because the infrastructure to process that does not exist. That's something that everyone here in this room, I think we can create some incredible opportunities from the creation of biobanks, to the way data is processed, to the inevitable uh, fruits of all of that labor. And uh, I'm looking forward to that over the next 10 years. Right. Thank you. Can I? Um, actually, I, um, what Kaola said just made me think, you know, we all came here to this conference, um, and yesterday we saw the unveiling of an excellent new piece of hardware that's gonna really reduce the cost of actually generating sequencing data. But this is such a good point, and I wanna make sure people are hearing this. It still is very expensive to store that data, process that data, and analyze that data. And so even though the cost of generation of the original data itself is becoming more and more affordable, this is that that's the next sort of bottleneck access point now because we don't talk enough about how much it costs to store yeah. all of these genomes when they're, when they're um, generated, but then analyze them and then make them available for, um, for research. So just wanted to, oh, yeah. yeah, totally agree. on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, makes my job easier. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, we're gonna kind of shift gears as, as we go into the, the tail end of this panel. And you know, what I want to kind of ask each panelist is really, um, let's look in that futuristic view. You know, mm -hmm. let's talk about hope for the future because, you know, if we're not moving forward, you know, we're not existing. So, so Alicia, tell us just in your own words and your thoughts based on your experiences, 
what do you see as hope for the future as it pertains to genomics? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, everyone who is here believes that the future of medicine rests on a foundation of genomics. I think that's why we are all here. Mm. I think that in order for that future to be true, we have to really be seeing genomics be integrated into care in a more regular way. It can't just be this special thing that you order on the side that you have specific specialty clinics for because that means that only those large academic health centers that can afford the specialty clinics with the specialty providers are able to give access to this type of care. What that means then is that we really have to think about how we integrate genomic medicine into family practice primary care. And that also means that we're not just thinking about diverse clinical recruitment for research or for um, all of this new clinical trial work that we're doing, but it's literally about making sure that healthcare providers who are providing care to every person understands the value of genomic medicine, knows how to order it, and understands what is the appropriate patient set to be using that in. There's been studies that have shown that um, patients uh, in Texas who um, should be getting BRCA1 or 2 testing for ovarian cancer, um, if you are white, your provider knows that you need BRCA1 and 2 testing and you're getting access to that. Same symptoms you present and you are black or brown, you are 30% less likely to be ordered that test only because your provider doesn't know that you could have access to that test because they did not understand the value of BRCA1 and 2 testing. So it's not just about re reaching into the community itself, it's about making sure that the healthcare provider community along the way is understanding the value of this data, how to use it, and in what patients they should be using it in. And I do think then for the future, that's how we're gonna integrate genomics into the foundation of medicine. Thanks, Alicia. So, so Andrew, I mean, you're the CEO of a of a corporation, and you know, so so really, how how does private enterprise, you know, change, and what needs to happen to you know make some of this really go forward in terms of hope for the future? Yeah, I, I always say that our, our standards as a as the genetics community, as the genomics community, um, just need to change. Uh, the values that we, the standards that we hold ourselves to, need to change. Um, I use the example of corporate boards where not that long ago, to sort of all of our shame, you know, 10, 15 years ago, boards were routinely put together with no diversity and no one talked about it that much. Um, and now the community standards have changed. It is completely unacceptable to put to a corporate board and not take diversity into account. That wasn't that, that long ago. And I think we need to do the same thing in genomics research. Uh, it needs to become unacceptable to do large-scale uh, genomics research without having a, uh, an equity component and ensure that you're getting accurate data on, um, that represents the, the world's entire genetic diversity. We've done, as Naomi mentioned, we've done um, EGFR versus uh, MGFR, measured GFR research in, in South Africa, and the algorithm is just wrong. It's not right. And there, was no, there wasn't enough data to be able to demonstrate that. And you know, to date, it has been acceptable to put together data sets and do large research and not focus on um, inclusion um, and equity and making sure you have a diverse data set, and that standard needs to change. It, a few years from now, now, it should be unacceptable. Thanks, Andrew. So, so that leads into to Naomi. So uh, again, you're, you're in I, what I would consider the early part of the healthcare you know, journey, and you, you've seen a lot happen you know, in the past couple years. So tell us, w what do you think from your perspective, and I look at that, you, know, you kind of being the, the junior, but you know, in some ways seeing it from not a biased perspective at many of the rest of us on the stage, how do you see diversity in the workforce and diversity in the medicine, you know, changing to go forward to make a, you know, difference? Right. So before I answer that, I want to address Alicia's comments about um, getting genom genomic testing in the primary care, because I think that is absolutely critical. So I'm someone who is planning on going to primary care family practice, and what I've seen in my clinical training is that much of what we learn um, predisposes students to something called um, premature closure. So what that means is that we're taught these specific illness scripts about how an illness presents, who presents with that illness, and how to treat them. 
So when we talk about breast cancer, BRC1, BRC, uh, BRCA1, 2, the illness script for that is you're gonna look for a white woman in her early 30s, that's who you test. Everyone else, ignore it, right? Mm. Same thing for things like sickle cell. Sickle cell is a disease that only impacts black people. If you see anyone else that's not black that presents similarly, forget about it, that's not the case. Same with cystic fibrosis. This is a disease that only impacts white people. Forget about everyone else. So what happens is you have these patients that kind of don't fit these boxes that we've mm. decided that everybody should fit in, and they're the ones that get left behind. They're the ones that get found too late and end up having devastating consequences. So in order to really change how we practice things in primary care, we actually have to fundamentally change the way that we teach medical students. Um, and part of that, I think, is also changing the scope of who can we see as medical students, who can we see in PhD programs, et cetera. So in my medical school, I am one third of the black female student body in my class, which is an absolute shame for a large institution like the University of Washington. When you don't have people from different backgrounds rising up in the ranks, the changes that we're hoping to make aren't feasible, right? If you're hoping to work with these communities, bring in more genomic data, bring in more um, equity in health, but you don't actually have these communities leading, um, uh, leading these programs because they haven't gotten the education, you're doing them a further disservice because now you're going to the communities, extracting that data, using it for your benefit, and they're not the ones that are actually getting to participate in any kind of leadership role. So really what I think is that in order to move science forward, we need to increase who is able to come into science. Mm. And part of that, quite frankly, is actually money, right? So there are so many programs that are trying to bring in young people of color into science and medicine, but in order to get this population, you need to be able to provide them an incentive to move them away from other aspects of their life. So for example, if you're having internships, these internships need to be paid. When you have unpaid internships, who is able to participate? Those that already have money and connections, right? Students of color that disproportionately come from lower income backgrounds, you don't have the time to go to an internship that is unpaid because that time could be spent making money at a job to help you pay for other expenses. So if you're actually serious about making these changes, you have to put your money where your mouth is. You can't just make these statements. Okay. Thank you. That was great. So, Kielo, yep. you're the last one on, on this part of the, this conversation. So, you know, what do you see as, as hope for the future? A, a lot of things. Um, on the more technical end of things, I think Illumina is saying that there's this, you know, you know, race to the bottom, $200 price point. I was hoping it was going to be 100. We'll see. Maybe next year. <laughs> um, but you know, you want you want to see really interesting technological advancements. You want to see library prep free, right? We want to move directly in that direction. We want to see all of the different ways that we uh, forecast for point of care. And just for context, I am the director of the Indigenous Futures Institute at UCSD, so we think about the future quite a bit. Uh, other things are training, you know. How do, you, how do you move the tools you need to do on-site sequencing in really remote parts of the world into those spaces? Moderna and Pfizer are already doing this with shipping containers for manufacturing. They've cut out their cold chain. So this decentralized approach, not with just hardware, but, but data access and governance, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of development in that direction. I think that's essential. Then there's the training portion of this. You're going to see a lot of, I think, movement in the direction of XR, VR, and AR opportunities for people to communicate with folks. Uh, you know, If you have a problem with a sequencer in Boston or Seattle, 15 minutes, and the Illumina guy's there to fix it. But if you're in, I don't know, Kinshasa or Papaete, that's not the reality. So how do we decrease the gap in, in access on the hardware level? Then it's biobanking and, and storage of data and how we manipulate and mine that data. Somebody told me this recently, AI is becoming like plastic. There's so many opportunities to manipulate 
these large data sets, but there's a, like less attention on hyper-local solutions or what we uh, refer to in computer science as local complexity. So we need more hyper-local solutions, specifically in genomics, right, where everyone's genome is different. So we're gonna see a, a direction and a shift in that, in, in, in that way. And then you wanna see more people with chips in the game. So we started Native Biodata Consortia. That's the first biobank and genome sequencing center on a reservation in US history. And I'd like to see more of that. So I think it's looking really bright as we begin to decentralize all of the tools on both of those ends. And then training, as, as we're all alluding to here, how do you create the next generation or workforce that's really dialed in to many of these communities? And that's looking good too. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so as the moderator, I always get to throw a moderator's choice in here, so yeah. they have no idea what's coming with this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. but, but I think it's gonna be pretty easy. So um, all of us have attended the, the conference the past few days, so you know, we've seen some great speakers. So is each of you tell me in a, you know, a minute or two just something that really stood out about the other speakers at this conference when we're talking about this conversation about equity and genomics for all. So, I'll let whoever is ready to go, you know, take it and we'll go from there. I can start. Now me, Erica. Yeah, I think something that has really stuck with me is that equity in research is even a conversation that's being had in the first place, right? That like people are actually taking this not as just kind of the next most fashionable thing that's come up in the last few years, but an actual serious commitment, which I think me as a medical student at the beginning of medical school, um, there was a lot of difficulty in talking about even racism and equity in healthcare um, with my classmates, with faculty. And what I've seen is that there's been a purposeful shift to making this something that's more important. People aren't just seeing it as, you know, the hot topic, but as something that is fundamental to what we're trying to do for these communities. If you don't focus on justice and health, that you're not really making the impact that you think that you're making. You're making the impact for only a small percentage of the population. So it's been really refreshing to be in an environment where people are very vocal and excited to be moving um, in this direction. Thank you. I I worked for Bill Gates for 10 years, so I have to, I have to call him. I mean, what really, <laughs> what, really, what really struck me there is he gets, he sees the huge potential of genomics across so many different areas, and he understands that if you don't um, take an inclusive lens, if you don't do surveillance globally, if you don't have surveillance networks set up throughout Africa, it's not gonna be anywhere near as useful as just setting up a surveillance network. Um, that just is in, in the United, United States. If you're doing genomic drug discovery, if you don't take into account the human genetic variation found in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you're, you're doing it wrong. You're, you're fighting with one hand tied behind your back. Mm -hmm. um, and just as he walked through every potential application, the long list from malaria to TB to HIV to surveillance to drug discovery, it's just, um, you know, it's, it's thrilling to see the potential of, of genomics that's you know, even more so with the, the new tools and lower cost uh, that have been announced this, this week um, you know, in a community that's just really getting started with this work. Thanks. Oh, I guess I'll, uh, I just wanna harken back to yesterday with the Hawaii's first president. Uh, <laughs> it was, I mean, that guy is just like such an incredible <laughs> public speaker. Uh, he just, he did like so many things that like I, I, I obviously would, I think all of us up here would like to emulate, but one of them was like casting shade at people but not saying their name. <laughs> I, was, I was like, that's brilliant. No, but he used this, he used this term, right? He used this term creakiness to describe our healthcare system, right? And we know that he was just on this passionate crusade to improve that system. Um, and um, it just got me really thinking about like, is creakiness a synonym for corruption? Is creakiness, <laughs> like does this, is this, uh, how, how, what are the like large scale entry points to get genomics into this position in this country where there's so much technological innovation on the algorithm development end, on the hardware end, 
Like this is the epicenter for that, but we can't even move it into our own healthcare system in the ways that would be mutually beneficial in terms of financial support, but also improving people's quality of life. And, and uh, it just got me thinking. I think Illumina needs to buy Epic health systems <laughs> or, or really think about interoperability in those ways. But yeah, it just got me, you know, just thinking about that, so. Yeah. Take it away. No. <laughs> no, it's a great point. I'm sure Judy Falcon would love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, my takeaway was definitely also from Obama, um, just the, at the end, sort of the idea that he's still the hope guy. I mean, you can imagine how much um, he has the right to not have hope anymore, and yet he still wanted to be the hope guy at the end. And I think that's something that um, reminds all of us why we're here doing what we do. I think, to your point about the creakiness of the system, I think we've talked a lot today about the importance of diversity in representation in mm -hmm. your data sets, in your recruitment, in your workforce. Um, but also, at the end of the day, when we think about what are the incentives that cause for folks to actually invest in these types of measures, we have to have diversity in the outcomes data that comes out on the other end. And so what that means then, it's not about how many people enter into your trial that are from these diverse cohorts. The question is how much drop off do you have along the course of your clinical trial? And then what is the outcomes that you see from those same um, individuals at the end of your trial? Did you make your clinical trial recruitment easy enough for folks to stay in that they didn't have to take themselves to an academic medical center for their you know, annual whatever uh, screen or to answer their survey questions? Did you make it easy for those clinical trial participants from those diverse populations to stay so that at the end you can demonstrate the differentiated outcomes in those populations? Because at the end of the day, if we can't actually show that the medicine works in every person, then you're still gonna have a diversity problem at the end. It's still going to be dosing that's most correct for your European population or for the folks that were able to stay through that trial. So I think when we think about what are the ways to really affect the ability to pull through this data and really use it in that way, it has to be at every point along the way. It's in that enrollment upfront, it's in the way you design your recruitment, it's in the way you do your longitudinal continuous studying, and it's in the way that you report the outcomes, mm -hmm. and then we can feed that back into the practice of medicine, family medicine, primary care, educate your healthcare providers, and that's when we're gonna see that full life cycle actually work for every person that needs, it needs to work for. Thanks, Alicia. So, dealer's choice again. <laughs> so, one minute each on, on this one. So, so tell me, think about, you know, who is probably one of the most influential mentors that you've had in your career so far, but, but tell me who they are in one minute, but then what was it that they really did to inspire you as you look about, you talk about equity in genomics or equity in healthcare. Mm. Go, Alicia. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, my, I mean, early, early in my career when I was an undergrad at MIT, I had the privilege to work for Bob Weinberg, um, who of course is a very famous cancer researcher, discoverer of the RAS uh, protein, um, and really changed the way we think about oncology. Um, and I was a freshman uh, working for him in the undergraduate research uh, program at MIT, and I walked into his office. I had Googled um, MIT cancer, and he was the first thing that had come up, and so I had emailed him and asked him to work in his lab. Um, and when I was sitting there with him for like the 10 minutes that we had, I realized how much he was investing in understanding who I was as a person, rather than just another freshman on the MIT campus. And he really changed the way that I think about mentorship and senior leadership, and it's really about really investing in the individual, and he made me believe that I could be something one day, and I, it st sticks to me today that, you know, here's this guy who has trained thousands and thousands of cancer researchers over his career, you know, he had no reason necessarily to care about this freshman who was going to 
do a couple of years in his lab, and yet he took the time to understand who I was, what my name was, where I was from. Uh, and I remember, I remember starting like having this pitch of like, oh, I'm, I want to do this. Like, we, you, I read this paper, and I really want to do this thing. And, and he was like, forget all that. Like, where are you from? Like, where are your, where's your family from? Like, tell me, how, tell me how you got here. Um, and that has always stuck with me. Okay, thanks. Who wants to take the next one? Now me. Go ahead. Um, so my first year of undergrad, I, I met somebody named um, Dr. Michael Bombshad. He's an MD, PhD at University of Washington. He studies congenital contracture syndromes. And I started working in his lab my, the summer after my senior year of high school. And at that time, I, had, I knew I wanted to be in science, but I didn't really know what. And he invited me to work in his lab, um, which was very generous to do for like an 18 year old that didn't know anything. And when I talked to him, I was like, okay, I'll do this for free. I'll do school credit, you know, whatever you want. And he was like, no, 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 no. If you're gonna work in this lab, you're gonna be an active team member. We're gonna pay you so you can, you know, pay for your, help pay for your schooling. And I'm gonna make sure that you are involved in publications, in papers, in conferences. And it was because of this kind of advocacy that he had for me that by the time I graduated undergrad, I had publications in Nature, I had presented at research conferences across the country, I had been able to do research at the Broad Institute and at Harvard HST. And this is someone that, like, you know, took me from under a high schooler, 18 year old, to now still serves as one of my closest mentors. And, has always been an advocate for me. He's met my family, he knows about my heritage from Congo, has taken an interest in all those things and has continued to do that kind of same work with other students because he really believes in increasing diversity in research and medicine. And that's someone that I think has made a huge influence in my life and the direction that I've taken. Thank you. Yeah. He was right. on my PhD committee, by the way. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. He's two for two then. Um, um, mine's a little cheesy, but I think you got to go with uh, what's true. You know, I started my career as a, as a peer investor, or Goldman Sachs, TPG, um, and I actually loved the work, uh, but I felt what I was accomplishing in life was making rich people slightly richer. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, at uh, conversations over dinner with my wife, who was in global public health and talking about her work in TB and HIV and malaria and working in, in geographies all around the globe, it got me thinking, could I apply what I love, sort of the power of biotech and the innovation of biotech um, in a way that was more inclusive, that took equity into account? Um, is there a way to combine those two worlds, which uh, I started from uh, running the, the Strategic Investment Fund at the Gates Foundation for a number of years and now at, at Variant Bio. So really uh, sort of a talk of those conversations um, led me to change what I wanted to accomplish in my, in my life and, and made a big difference. So. Thanks. Keola, take us on. Oh, man, it's such a, that's a really hard, loaded one because there's so many people that influence your path and, you know, starting with your family and, and, and so on. But, uh, gosh, if I have to pick someone, I would say I got to work at NHGRI. That was my first entry point, you know, working for the feds. <laughs> and, uh, and I worked with Charles Rotimi, who was a really interesting character. Everybody in that shop was from, I didn't, I didn't understand like how much bias there was in genomics at that time. Everybody we worked with was from Nigeria, Cameroon, Ethiopia, and the postdoc who was my kind of boss, he taught me how to tie a tie, he did a lot of stuff. <laughs> but he came from, he worked on this project in Walaita, Ethiopia, and it was podoconiosis. And it was uh, interesting because people developed this issue with their feet because they're working in fields and cropping, um, not wearing shoes, and there's little tiny pieces of obsidian. So some people develop mossy foot syndrome and some people don't. And this is such an interesting entry point for genomic technologies. So they do this whole cohort study, they identify this mutation in a, you know inflammation related gene on chromosome six. And then he published it in New England Journal of Medicine, and I just thought that was normal. I thought that was like the status quo, like, oh yeah, that's what you do. And, but it was such an elegant project along the way. I learned so much, and those people really made me believe in myself and the things that we do and our focus on historically marginalized communities. So thanks to those guys. All right. Yeah. Thanks. You know, I wanted to add that last part on it because, you know, I think you know, in my role and what I do in my life, I sit on several healthcare boards and I'm a, 
always passionate about leadership and mentorship. Mm. And you know, I wanted all of them to tell a story because I think everybody in this room has a story. And I think it's, in, you know, as a leader, it's important that you continue to mentor people because that's the only way we're going to accomplish and sort through these things around equity and you know, no matter what technology and whatever advancement comes forward. So thanks for that. Thanks for coming, everyone. And, you know, have a good time the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.